Hello and welcome to this video on the Bohr equation. Uh, this video follows on from a previous video on dead space and so it's worth watching that one first and then coming on to this. Um, in essence the Bohr equation uh, gives us a ratio of uh, dead space volume as a proportion of tidal volume and it focuses on the physiological dead space which we'll go on to talk about and it does this by equating it to some terms involving CO2. The equation itself at first glance uh, can look uh, not particularly appetizing um, but hopefully by the end of this uh, video we'll, we'll have gone through the physiological principles of it uh, and you'll be in a position to explain this um, in a viva scenario. So to start with we'll have a look at uh, a recap of dead space, its, its constituent parts and what we can measure and what we can't measure. We'll go on to look at the physiological principles underpinning uh, the Bohr equation. We'll then go on to look at the mathematical derivation uh, including um, the use of Dalton's law and then an assumption uh, about uh, CO2 that, that, that is important to, to understand as part of it. Uh, and then we'll have a brief discussion about the clinical applications of the Bohr equation. And so to briefly recap, we said that the physiological dead space, which was the total amount of dead space that we had, was equal to the anatomical dead space, which was the volumes of the airways which had uh, no respiratory epithelium, uh, plus the alveolar dead space, which was the volume of our alveoli which were ventilated but not perfused. We then went on to say that the alveolar dead space is actually hard to measure, so uh, we can't measure that directly. The anatomical dead space we can measure using Fowler's method, which will be discussed in another video, and it's the physiological dead space, so the total amount, that is um, calculated using the Bohr equation. So this will be the focus of this video. And now we go on to look at the principles uh, underpinning the Bohr equation. And the first thing to focus on is how we're defining our volumes and what nomenclature we're using. So we're looking at the volumes of the lung. So if we start with um, a schematic of a lung, this is clearly not uh, an anatomical diagram, but within this, we have an entire volume of the lung, which will be at tidal volume. And then as a fraction of that tidal volume will not be involved in gas exchange. And this will be our dead space volume, our physiological dead space volume. The rest of the lung will be involved in gas exchange and this won't be included in our dead space. And we can use some labels to, to adhere to these. So we've got a total volume, which we'll define as VT. And you'll see this will, uh, this will be what you'll see in the textbooks as well. So volume with T it means total or tidal. And then within that volume, you've got the dead space volume. So that will be defined as VD. Now, the area that is not dead space, the area that involved in gas exchange, will just be the difference between the tidal volume and the dead space volume. So it will just be VT minus VD. So we've only got two terms that we're using. We're only using the VT and VD terms, so tidal volume and dead space volume, but we've got three important different volumes that we're talking about. The first of which is the whole thing, so the tidal volume. The second of which is the dead space volume. And the third of which is the volume of the airways involved in gas exchange, namely the difference between the two VT minus VD. And next we assign labels for the different CO2 concentrations uh, in different volumes of gases. So going back to our lung, we've got a concentration of CO2 in the inspired gas, so we'll label that Fi, or fraction of inspired. We do the same for the expired gas, and we label that as Fe. We label the concentration of CO2 uh, in the alveolar space, so this is the volume of lung that is involved in gas exchange, as Fa. There's a concentration of CO2 gas in the dead space, which we'll label as Fd. Then we can very quickly make an early uh, simplification, and we can say that the, because of this uh, dead space not being involved in gas exchange, there'll be no CO2 changes to that because it won't, be, uh, it won't be moving into or out of the pulmonary capillaries. So we can say that the FD, the dead space fraction, will be the same as the inspired fraction. And so this term here just becomes FI. And the derivation uh, is then made by considering a single tidal expiration. So we have a certain amount of CO2 in our lung before we breathe out. Uh, and then we have a certain amount of CO2 after we've breathed out in this, in this gas here. 
And to calculate the amount of CO2, we simply multiply the concentration by a volume, and that will be different depending on um, what volume we're talking about. And then we have a start state and an end state. So our start state is when gas is within our lung prior to our tidal volume expiration. And the amount of CO2 uh, in this, uh, at this moment in time will be an addition of both the amount of CO2 within the dead space plus the amount of CO2 within the alveolar space. Well, the amount of CO2 within the dead space, we've already said, will be the concentration times by the volume. So the concentration within the dead space of CO2, as previously discussed, will be the fraction of inspired CO2 and the volume will be the dead space volume by definition. And then we do the same thing for this volume, which will be the concentration within the alveolar space, Fa, multiplied by the volume of this, which is the tidal volume minus the dead space. So that gives us the amount of CO2 that we start with. At the end, we're then considering the expired gases. So that will be the concentration within the expired gas, Fe, multiplied by the volume of the expired gas, which by definition will be the tidal volume. And then the rest is just a bit of mathematics to say, well, this term here equates to this term here, and we can do some rearranging to then get to the Bohr equation. And so we can now make sense of this term here, where we said that this is the amount of CO2 after we've breathed out, and this is the amount of CO2 in our lungs before we breathed out. It's important now to recognise that the fraction of inspired CO2, or concentration of CO2 in the air, is vanishingly small, so this whole term here can just cancel. Then we can go through a series of mathematical steps so we can expand the brackets, we can collect the like terms, we can factorise with respect to Vt and then we can rearrange to get something that's close to the Bohr equation and we're nearly there. And once we get to this stage we invoke Dalton's law which states that the concentration of a gas is proportional to its partial pressure and what that means we can do is we can say rather than saying a fraction uh, of CO2 within a gas, we can actually talk about the partial pressure of CO2 within a given gas. So the Fa term becomes a partial pressure of CO2 within the alveolar gas, and the Fe term becomes the partial pressure of CO2 within the expired gases. And so that means that we can rewrite the equation as this in this form here, and this is uh, the Bohr equation. And at this stage, it's important to point out that. Uh, measuring the CO2 partial pressure within the alveolar space is incredibly hard to do. So we can take this equation one step further by making an assumption. And the assumption goes that the partial pressure of CO2 within the alveolar space is equivalent to that of the CO2 tension within the pulmonary capillaries because CO2 freely diffuses across this membrane. Mathematically, we can say that that means that P big A CO2, so partial pressure with, of, within the alveoli of CO2, is equivalent to P small a CO2, which is the partial pressure of CO2 within an arterial sample. And what that means is that we go from something that's very difficult to measure to something that we can measure on a, an arterial blood gas. And by making that substitution, it gives us the final form of the Bohr equation, which is seen here. And applying this clinically, we've already said that the Bohr equation gives us a ratio of dead space volume uh, to tidal volume. And typical values are in the region of about 0.3, namely that about a third of your tidal volume uh, is physiological dead space. In situations where there is um, pathologically raised dead space volume, so these could be uh, low cardiac output states, um, large pulmonary emboli, uh, or the use of excessive PEEP, um, you will see a significant increase uh, in this ratio. And there'll be patients where you can see the Bohr equation in action. So if you've got a patient on intensive care where they've got invasive arterial monitoring, so you can regularly monitor their PaCO2, and if they're intubated and ventilated and have end tidal capnography, for any patients that fit this bill or for any other reason of raised dead space, what you'll see is a large difference between the measured uh, arterial CO2 on the gas, so you'll have numbers that are probably showing hypercapnia, six or seven kilopascals, but you'll have relatively modest end tidal CO2 on the capnography. And that's the Bohr equation in action showing you that this ratio has increased. Thanks for listening. I hope that was useful.